I'm Alex Mosed, and welcome to Winner Take All. I'm very excited to have Jim Rickards here with me as a uh, special guest on the show. He has just published his now seventh book uh, called The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World. Uh, Jim, great to have you with us. It's great to be with you, Alex. I could pr- try and give my background uh, on, on your illustrious career here, but um, I probably wouldn't do it justice. You've, you've gone from Wall Street to advising uh, the U.S. government, uh, federal agencies, uh, writing now a number of books uh, and, and, and including New York Times bestsellers here. What did I miss? You know, how, do you, how would you kind of characterize some of your background here that, that has led you to write uh, this book, which I've read, by the way, and is, is pretty fantastic? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Um, I started uh, my career as a lawyer in the late 70s, but before I went to law school, I got a graduate degree in international economics. So I had that, you know, that macroeconomic uh, background. Uh, if you will, even before law. And then after getting out of law school, I worked, I started my career as uh, international tax counsel for Citibank. So that's about as broad a, um, a platform as you can have. Uh, and then along the way, um, switched into securities and derivatives law, worked for an investment bank, major deal in US government securities. That gave me a pretty good background in federal finance. Um, and then switched to the hedge fund world um, and was there from start to finish at long-term capital management, uh, made a few headlines in 1998, and I was the principal negotiator of that rescue by, people say I was rescued by the Federal Reserve, that's not exactly right. The Federal Reserve did convene a meeting of the banks to organize the rescue, but said to the banks, you have to do this. We're, they were sitting in the boardroom at the Fed, kind of hard to say no, but they uh, adjourned over to Merrill Lynch's boardroom a few blocks away on Liberty Street, and we took it from there. And uh, it was one of those deals, you know, five days, no sleep, everyone's, nobody's shaving. At first the jackets come off, then the ties come off, then the shirts are unbuttoned, and everyone's got a beard, nobody slept, but we got it done, brought it in for a soft landing. Um, after that, I ran an electronic stock exchange for a while, uh, but was tapped by the CIA to help them with counterterrorist finance after 9-11 and worked for them for 10 years. Um, doing uh, this, what we did, we invented a new branch of intelligence called Mark Int for market intelligence, basically getting actionable intelligence from capital markets information, uh, which had never been done before. There's uh, the Int is, stands for intelligence, so human Int is human intelligence, Sig Int is signals intelligence. Uh, we invented uh, Mark Int or market intelligence. Um, and it took on life of its own. Uh, and then, but along the way, um, was uh, just got literally a cold call from a top literary agent. She heard an interview I did on oh, NPR's Planet Money. She's an NPR fan uh, and introduced herself and said, how would you like to write a book? And so I said, I hadn't really thought about it, but let's talk. And we had lunch, hit it off. And then that led to book projects. And now, um, you know, seven books and 10 years later, here we are. So either uh, you can either say I had an eclectic career or I didn't what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I've done uh, a a little bit of everything from banking, capital markets, hedge funds, um, national security, intelligence, work with the Defense Department, um, and written a bunch of books. Well, it's great to have you here. I mean, and and the first book, which came out 2011, was Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. And uh, we're certainly, you certainly touch on a lot of currency dynamics, um, which are certainly prescient to what's going on today um, in, in the latest book, The New Great Depression here. When did you start writing this book? It's just come out in the past week, uh, but, it, but it just seems so, uh, so relevant and, and, and timely. I mean, you must have had some pretty fast turnaround on this thing, right? We did. Uh, I, I got the call from uh, my agent, my my publisher, um, late April. And of course, then we were in the thick of uh, the, the first wave of infections and fatalities, sadly, and quarantine and lockdown and all that. But And the stock market had just dropped 30%, over 30% from um, February 24th to March 23rd. Um, and so they said, we, we, we really want to book on this. It's really important. Um, there's going to be huge interest in this. Uh, 
And can we do this? And I said, sure. Uh, and our original target day was July 15th. We were trying to come out on July 15th. And that's what we worked towards. So um, I said, I, so basically given the target length and the outline, I was going to write it in about 40 days, 45 days. Um, if you do 2,000 words a day, you can get there, but that's a lot of writing. So I said to my wife, well, the good news, bad news, the, the bad news is for the next 30 days, I'm going to be the most antisocial person you ever met. The good news is we'll have a book behind us and, and we'll get that done. And that's pretty much what we did. I worked really hard straight through and kind of writing in the morning and reading at night and you know, almost like researching, uh, uh, you know, doing the research at night, and then waking up the next morning and writing up the research and, and other observations. And it was all happening very quickly. I mean, obviously the disease was expanding. The economy was collapsing, uh, but the amount of uh, academic literature on the subject was, you, you get, we're getting 10 papers a day coming from all over the place, and, and that was good, but it was an enor enormous amount. But, the, um, but when I first discussed it with my publisher, they said, well, you know, Jim, we, we think you're great on uh, the economy and capital markets and central banking, and all that's really important, and that's what we want you to write about. But keep away from the, you know, the epidemiology and the immunology because you're not... Um, you're not a scientist, you're not a doctor. And I said, hold on, um, that's like asking someone to write about property damage in New Orleans in 2005 and not mention Hurricane Katrina. I said, it, it, you can't do that. You, you Obviously the pandemic is the catalyst or the cause of the depression and you can't understand one without understanding the other. So I said, I'm gonna do both. I, I teased her a little bit. I said, well, you know, I do, I do have two degrees from Johns Hopkins, so I'm not, uh, I'm not intimidated by natural science. I'm, I'm not a doctor, of course, but um, uh, I, it's, I'm comfortable in the field. And when I approached it, when I started doing the research, so, so by the way, Alex, this is the first book that deals with both the pandemic and the what I call the new Great Depression or the economy. Uh, there will be lots of books written on the pandemic. Doctors have already written some. They're out there. Uh, there'll be books written on the economic crash and what's going on. Although it's a funny thing, economists actually don't write that many books. There are some uh, other than textbooks. Textbooks can be huge money makers, kind of boring. But uh, there are a few economists who write books. Paul Krugman does, and Barry Eichengreen, and a few others. But generally, economists prefer to write papers, journal articles, monographs, and things because it's because they're usually wrong and they're changing it. So you write a paper and you're wrong. Well, just write another paper, you know. Um, writing a book, you go out on a limb a little bit because if it's going to have any kind of shelf life, you have to lean forward and and do a little forecasting. And and I have ways of doing that that are better than what Wall Street and and Washington do. But um, but you're still at, at you're you know you're out on the out on the limb a little bit. Um, but I'm comfortable and and I've done that before. Uh, but on the uh, on the medical side of it, um, there were I read over a hundred peer reviewed journal articles, uh, obviously, you know, top publications like The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine and others, but others that, that were top tier, maybe less well-known, more specialized, but these papers were coming out uh, left and right and other evidence was coming out. And when I started doing the research, I said, well, this is going to be straightforward. There's a bunch of conspiracy theories and fringe theories and just wacky you know, speculation over here, and there's a lot of good science by reputable uh, clinicians and, and PhDs over here, and just kind of discard this and focus on this. And that's what I did. But what I discovered, it was easy to discard the junk, but when I got into what I'll call real science, I discovered quickly that the scientists don't agree with each other. Um, I can show you papers that say, um, you know, you're, you're a fool to go out without a mask. Masks are the key to this whole thing. Everybody mask up. That's the way we get a handle on the pandemic. I can show you other papers by equally qualified people, PhDs in virology and epidemiology who say, no, masks don't work. The virus is too small. It goes through the weave. Uh, they're improperly constructed. We don't wear them correctly uh, and they don't do much good. It's kind of virtue signaling. And, and, and so, the, but my point is without even taking sides in that, just as a writer, um, uh, and I did present both views and, and all that information is in the end notes. Um, the, the book has over 200 end notes and they're all fairly technical. So I tell people, if you don't like something I said, don't argue with me, uh, go to the, go to the foot, footnotes or the end notes and argue with the, uh, the scientists. But I, I tried to, when there were divisions like that, I tried to represent both sides fairly, but I, I usually do come down on one side or the other based on my own view uh, of the evidence. Um, 
So that made it more challenging. And then you also had this whole, you know, where did the virus come from? I have a chapter on that. Well, there's the, the wet market theory, which I thought at the time, I thought last spring was um, a lie, basically Chinese propaganda. That's even more apparent today. You have the laboratory theory that it came from a laboratory, particularly the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Good evidence that that was the case last spring. That's much stronger today. A ton of stuff has come in literally in the last couple of weeks bearing that out. Uh, so, uh, but I, that's how I came out in the book. I said it did come from the laboratory, but that's another area where, again, I can, I can find uh, top scientists with both points of view. I, I did learn in reading these scientific journal articles, you know, there's always an abstract that the authors, their affiliations, the abstract, and then the main paper. I would go right to the last page and look at who paid them. Uh, because they're, you know, modern practices, you disclose your sources of research grant. If I saw you were paid by the Chinese, I, I discounted you about 50%. I might have included it, but I, <laughs> I certainly took that into account. We talk all, all the time on the show about tech monopolies, right? If you remember back in the summer, YouTube co-opted all the tech monopolies. They co-opted WHO guidance, right? Which, which as you talk about in the book, was cle- clearly compromised. Right. And so you essentially have platforms which are in the business of facilitating the exchange of information, co-opting a compromised organization, the WHO. If I had spoken on the show that the virus could have come from a lab, you can't disagree with the WHO, uh, you're inciting violence, and we're going to kick you off of YouTube. Uh, I mean, just if we looked at the, the kind of macroeconomic situation, trade, and other things, and so let's, let's get into that. You I mean, this was uh, was was book number one, Currency Wars, right? That was book number one that came out in uh, 2011. Um, and what was interesting about that, I, I started writing in 2010. That was the first book. And uh, the first two chapters um, talk about I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. They didn't need any help from me on war games generally but they never done a financial war game before. And so they needed to tap the financial expertise. And I was asked, asked to help with that. We did this at a place, a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. It's part of uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, but it's off camp. It's, it's halfway between Washington and Baltimore and farm area in Laurel, Maryland. Don't try, don't try getting in without a pass. Um, but um, uh, one of the things we did there I was, uh, why well, design? I helped design the game with a few others, and then I was on the China team, and I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat, and steal because that's what Wall Street does, and that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine, who's fluent in Russian, to be on the Russian team, and I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. Um, this was totally off the books. I said, I'm I'm going to persuade my um, China team colleagues to um, uh, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're gonna say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're gonna put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're gonna issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. But here's the, here's the thing, we're gonna say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. Well, the first thing, so then I, I persuaded my friend to get the Russia team to join us. Uh, it ended up, Russia said they would do it. I couldn't persuade my Chinese guys. By the way, one of the guys on the China team, uh, my China team in 2009, ended up running the Asian desk at the National Security Council for the next eight years, uh, uh, working for the Obama administration. So we so had a Harvard professor. It's a pretty high level group. But um, but we went ahead with it. But the, so the first thing that happened when these because you you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. 
The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no, no, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, and about 100 people in the room, you know, three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, over the course of two days, it, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Uh, okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what, were the, what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, it, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold, and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the U.S. treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is, that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said, currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. So here we are in 2021. This book came out in 2011, so 10 years ago. And every now and then I'll see a headline that says, you know, currency war has broken out. And I laugh. I said, no, it's the same currency war. It comes as no surprise that 10 years after the book came out, we're, we're still in a currency war and we will be for the foreseeable future. So that book is actually very uh, fresh. Uh, it talks about Ukraine, uh, talks about a lot of things that were way over the horizon. Absolutely. And so, so let me play this one little graphic here because, because cause, cause the concept of currency war, and, and it's, it's clear that China wants to undo the power that the, you know, the U.S. dollar and the Fed has over basically you know, the global financial system. But, but, but I feel like this video really does a good job visualizing some of what you're talking about. And it adds an interesting dynamic to understand what China has been doing inside of China with their currency and, and really the devastating impact of, of this shift, which, which they're actively working on here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is internal. Yeah. And the economy of yeah, China in, in, in dollars saying. is external. Yeah. And they're desperately in need of dollars because that's how they trade with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. what, what was so compelling when I met you, the most compelling thing that you showed me was the chart of Chinese M2, the moving graphic. Yes. And uh, we'll provide that moving graphic to the Real Vision audience uh, mm. uh, separately in this video. Uh, but more importantly, Chinese M2 has grown from $1 trillion worth of RMB yeah. to, as you say, $30 trillion on an economy of 12. Yes. They've printed more money internally yeah. than any one country in the history of the world as a percentage of GDP yeah. um, and as a percent, as, as, as call it M2 growth versus GDP growth, nothing has ever come that close. Yeah. So they've created a false economy. China is just aggressively printing insane amounts of money. And I mean, I, I don't trust a single stat out of China. If they're printing insane amounts of money, even putting what we've done in the US just in the past year to shame, and then if, if, if they are starting to actually shift the standard over to themselves, um, I mean, this, th that's a, these are very massive impacts, which, which I don't think many, if, if any, people are really appreciating here. But that, that's going on, right? Or would you say that's going on? And what happens when that shift st does start to happen uh, where, where they make themselves that standard? Well, a couple of things. I mean, the, the, what you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about $3.5 to $7.5 trillion. So, yeah, we printed $4 trillion in the past year. Didn't do any good. Won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but the Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. 
Um, they, it's, the economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The U.S. is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. Um, and the ghost cities are interesting. I, I was there one, uh, I don't know, south of uh, Nanjing, uh, kind of out in the boondocks a little bit. But I was, you know, you always have Communist Party officials with you. They're keeping an eye on you. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. cetera. Um, and it's all empty. I mean, this is all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it's still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened, you know, uh, 15 years ago. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time. Today it's the Congo. I was in Kinshasa. But it was right after the 70s commodities boom when cocoa prices and oil prices and copper prices were skyrocketing because of inflation. And they took the money. Of course, they wasted it. And they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa. Um, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. It's, it's, uh, if you've read, uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you kind of get the idea. But, um, but there's a skyscraper and, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might have looked nice the day they built it, but, it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime. Maybe never. Maybe never. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. But it's not as if, and China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. They're treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in uh, with maturities. You need, uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians. The rule of law, there's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, um, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since, and others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. Um, they don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure, and most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't throw a Chinese, you know, trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. 
Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. Where's the rule of law with Bitcoin? Doesn't exist. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. In other words, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it, you're right op edge, you're pro fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. It is, it is. But it, it does, you know, if we bring it full circle back to the book, you know, a lot of what you talk about here. You know, there's a line in here, which is we got $3 trillion of new Federal Reserve money and $4 trillion of deficit spending by Congress. However, they will not cure the depression. Money printing and big spending may help keep the lights on in the economy, but those policies should not be confused with stimulus. And I right. think your broader point here is around this idea of confidence. And confidence is this, is, is, is this very, you know, delicate thing to describe that if if you're if you're building a house of cards as as you know i think we've seen reports that china is essentially just their their internal printing press and all this there's a lot of house of cards going on inside of china how 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 much that's insulated inside of china how much of it leaks out whatever that's a whole other conversation but is unfortunately the united united states have we put ourselves into that danger zone where you know, the house of cards is now just, there's so many cards in it that, that we're close to having that thing collapse. And it really comes down to confidence. And if you keep printing all this money and you got, what, what do we have now? Like $26 trillion in, in deficit. The Fed has a seven and a half trillion dollar balance sheet. At some point, do people start to lose faith in the dollar? And then maybe that accelerates your point here on gold. Let's um, let's break that into two parts. Let's separate confidence, which is a big deal, and stimulus, which is also what I was talking about in, in the caption you read. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. Uh, so we can... And they're not going to be global reserve currencies. We can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States. So the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed four trillion dollars. Congress, we had trillion dollar what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now Congress put three trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put three trillion on top of this. So there's four trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week. Uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's $5 trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a $2 trillion rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan. Now, so that's $7 trillion plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's $8 trillion in deficit spending in two fiscal years, $4 trillion of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not that's not projections. That That's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it, again, as I say, keep the lights on? Yes. Did, would, it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't, like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, 
You can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order to potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. And by the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the, you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. It's how much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the $7 trillion, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about 6 or 7% for 2020. We don't have the, those numbers yet. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, uh, and then down in 2020. We're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies. Like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are. The people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong. That's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. Um, so so they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks. And people are going to get those checks. And they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, or sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. And um, so certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next. Like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP, and it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above ninety percent, that's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get ninety cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up. A dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. Um, and it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. 
But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptations people look at say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book The New Great Depression. So in closing, with some bad stuff on the horizon, we don't know how it's going to sort out, but this is just not sustainable. And there's Correct. no realistic way out of this. There's certainly no leadership to get us across the finish line. That's for sure. So, you know, you talk about some options. I'm not going to give them away. You got to get the book. But I had a couple of questions for you about your options. When you talk about gold, um, are you saying buy gold bullion or buy a gold ETF? Or is that pointless? you know, an ETF that tracks gold because when the crash is here, you're not going to be able to get it out anyway. Are you saying try and buy actual gold bullion? I recommend investors buy physical gold bullion. It could be coins, bars. You need a safe place to put it. Don't put it in the bank because there's a, there's a conditional correlation between the time you really want your gold and the time the banks are closed. So that's the worst place to put it. But you, yeah, you need a custodian or some, some arrangement that's safe uh, to put your gold. Now, look, if you're a trader or a hedge fund or you just want price exposure and you, for a short period of time, uh, fine. You know, buy an ETF, buy a gold futures contract or whatever. But if you want to preserve wealth and uh, participate uh, positively in what could be some very bad outcomes, you want the physical bullion. Um, but just to be clear, I recommend 10%. You know, people always want to put words in your mouth and go, Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I never said that. I think it's a really bad idea. My advice is, uh, my recommendation would be buy up to 10%. That's enough. So if I'm right, and obviously I think I am right, I wouldn't be saying this, but if I'm right about gold going to ten or $15,000 an ounce in the next several years, you're going to make so much money, even on a 10% allocation, that's basically going to insulate the rest of your portfolio. Um, if I'm wrong, which I don't think I am, but you're not going to get hurt too badly with a 10% allocation. So that's the right amount. And there's room for equities, but I also recommend a big slug of cash um, because uh, people go, well, cash has no yield. I was like, well, okay, but we could be in for deflation, not inflation. And in deflation, cash can actually be your best performing asset because the real value is going up your purchasing power is going up. So it makes it a winner and also reduces portfolio volatility. And finally, cash has embedded optionality. If you're the person with cash, visibility is not great right now. I, I do forecasting all day long, but I would say that there's a very high degree of uncertainty. That'll become more clear with the passage of time. So if you're the person with cash, as you get visibility, you can pivot. Maybe you want to buy more gold. Maybe you say, hey, it's all good. Let's buy some stocks. Maybe it's time to buy private equity, but you have those choices. But if you if you put all your bets down now, it can be very difficult to get out of them if you change your mind. You know, uh, Henry Kravis runs a good private equity fund, but don't try getting your money back early from from Henry Kravis, um, not before seven years. So cash gives you that optionality that that lets you um, be the shopper, be the buyer when everyone else is selling, for example, and treasury notes will do well because interest rates are going to go lower. So a slice of equities, a slice of treasury notes, big slice of cash, 10% gold. Uh, yeah, and there's room for some residential real estate, not commercial real estate that has not hit bottom, but residential real estate in, uh, certain cities should do well. You have time to answer. What about Bitcoin? Yeah, it's uh, knock yourself out. You know, when I, when I was a, uh, I was in junior high school. There was a popular dance song. It was called "Shout, Shout, Knock Yourself Out." So if you like it, go for it. I don't really care. I, Bitcoin uh, has no value. Um, I did an interview in December 2017. At the time, Bitcoin was going up almost a thousand dollars a day. So it was five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand, eight thousand. And the interview was a smart lady. She said, "Why don't you buy some?" I said, "Look, here's what's going to happen." I said, "It's going to go to twenty thousand, and then it's going to crash." And that's exactly what happened. It went to twenty thousand early January, and then it went down to uh, dropped uh, over eighty percent. Um, and look, I know people who bought it. 
in the hundreds, you know, four or 500 a Bitcoin and sold very close to the top, paid their taxes, good citizens, and they're multimillionaires. So, and those people are real, they're out there. But for every one of those, there's a, you know, South Korean garage mechanic who hawked his inventory to buy Bitcoin at 18,000 and committed suicide when it hit five. I'm serious, like real suicide. So, there's no value added. There's no, uh, see, Bill Gates is worth, I don't know, $100 billion or whatever. But he created value. I mean, he created some immeasurable, I don't like Microsoft software, but I, I, I wouldn't deny the fact that he earned his money and he created trillions of dollars of productivity and gains with his inventions and his share is 100 billion. I'm okay with that because that's his share of wealth creation, but there's no wealth creation in Bitcoin. It's just, you're just transferring wealth between buyers and sellers, but you're not creating any wealth. Um, and so if you made money in Bitcoin, I hope you can sleep at night because some people are, are committing suicide because of what they lost. Well, on that note, <laughs> uh, Jim Rickards, it's been amazing to have you. Get the book, The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure having you. Thank you.